Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we are going to talk about a very very important topic, the neurocysticercosis. The neurocysticercosis and the core concepts. Cysticercosis is a parasitic infection that results from the ingestion of eggs from the adult tapeworm tinea solium. When the cysticercosis affects the CNS, we call that as neurocysticercosis. The neurocysticercosis is the most common parasitic infection of the brain and a leading cause of epilepsy. So neurocysticercosis is caused by tinea solium and it usually presents with seizures. The life cycle of tinea solium. We have a normal life cycle of tinea solium but when it gets aberrant it results in neurocysticercosis. So first let's see the normal life cycle and then the aberration later. In the normal life cycle, the human being is the definitive host and they have the adult tapeworm in the intestine. And when the and the eggs are and the eggs and proglottidis are eliminated in the feces. If the pig eats these eggs, the pig is an intermediate host, then they develop cysticercosis in muscles. The cysticercosis in muscles of pig and therefore when the human being eats these cysticercosis present in the muscles, it develops into adult forms and goes back to the intestine. This is the normal life cycle of tinea solium which does not result in neurocysticercosis. It's a normal pattern. But when there is an aberration in this life cycle, then the human beings develop neurocysticercosis. What is this aberration? So when the humans have the adult tapeworm in the intestine and when they excrete it in the feces in the form of eggs or, or proclitotis, when they are eliminated in the feces, this time it is not the pigs. The human beings themselves get auto-infected by consuming these eggs or by the oral fecal route or by auto inoculation whatever may be the mechanism they consume eggs directly so eggs are directly taken over by the fecal oral contamination and in the gastric acid the eggs released the eggs release it enters from the GIT into the vascular compartment and then it goes to the brain, muscle and eyes. So X release the oncospheres which get into the blood, goes back to the eye, brain and muscle. So this is an aberration. So normal is the human beings excrete eggs but then they are consumed by pigs which develop into cysticercei in the muscles and they are consumed by human beings. The aberration occurs when the when eggs are directly consumed by human beings instead of muscle cysticercei, when they directly consume eggs, then they develop neurocysticercosis. Right. To understand the pathophysiology, pathogenesis and treatment, very important is to understand the various cystic changes and stages which occur in the parenchyma, the brain parenchyma. We have basically four stages. These are very important to understand the pathogenesis and then the treatment also. We have basically four stages. Stage one is the vesicular cystic stage. Stage two is the colloidal cystic stage. Stage three is the nodal stage. And stage four is the calcified granuloma. In the stage one, that is the vesicular cystic stage, they are live larval cyst. They are live. And there is no immune response. 
since there is no immune response there is no contrast enhancement because only when there is immune response there is breakdown of the blood brain barrier contrast enters contrast enhancement happens so in the first stage vesicular stage you have a light larval cyst in fact you can visualize the presence of scolex there is no immune response and therefore there is no enhancement so this stage there is no immune response only live worm so here the treatment the preferred treatment for vesicular stage is to give the anti parasitic drug albendazole so for vesicular cyst if we give albendazole that is sufficient the next stage is the colloidal cystic stage in the colloidal cystic stage now the live worm in the vesicular stage starts disintegrating so once they start disintegrating and start dying there's lot of immunological reactions occurring in the colloidal stage because of these immunological reactions the blood brain barrier gets broken down and there is contrast enhancement so in the colloidal cystic stage there is a degeneration of the cyst obviously there is absence of scolex because the cyst is dying and there is a good immune response and because of that there is contrast enhancement why is this important because in this stage there is lot of immune reaction occurring we need to give steroids steroids are anti inflammatory drugs so for vesicular cystic stage where there is no inflammatory response no immune response steroids may not be given but for colloid cystic stage where there is immune response where there is contrast enhancement we need to give steroids the third is the nodular stage where there is further cystic degeneration with contrast enhancement and finally the fourth stage the dead tissue the calcified granuloma where it is dead but it produces gliosis it produces calcification which can be seen on ct scan as the punctate calcification but if they are in the cisternal or ventricular fluid they can produce hydrocephalus since in this calcified stage calcified granuloma stage it is dead but then it can cause gliosis so we give anti epileptic drugs it can cause epilepsy a propensity to cause recurrent seizures so to understand the treatment understanding these stages are very very important so in vesicular stage where it's a live worm where there is no immune reaction and there's no contrast enhancement the scolex is seen we give only albendazole to kill the live worm whereas in colloid stage the cyst starts degenerating it is dying and therefore inflammatory products are produced the blood brain barrier is broken down there is contrast enhancement so we give steroids and the final stage the calcified granuloma stage the tissue the worm is dead but it can cause gliosis and there's a propensity to seizures so we have to give anti epileptic drugs so understanding these stages are very important the treatment first the presentation they generally present with seizures 70 to 90% and the second common presentation is headache the most common presentation is seizures 70 to 90% in the vesicular and colloid cystic stage it is basically an immune reaction so it is more like a symptomatic seizure so we give anti epileptic drugs only for a limited period we treat the colloid and vesicular stage which present with seizures more like an acute symptomatic seizure and therefore we give anti epileptic drugs only for a limited period but in the calcified granuloma stage there is gliosis there is a propensity to recurrent seizures so it becomes epilepsy so we give anti epileptic drugs and we treat as epilepsy so very important point vesicular cyst and colloid cystic stage we give anti epileptic drugs and treat as an acute symptomatic stage whereas when it is calcified granuloma it is it causes gliosis so we give anti epileptic drugs and treat epilepsy and give for a long period headache headache is because of hydrocephalus or increased intracranial pressure or because of meningitis when there is hydrocephalus 
anti parasitic drug is withheld if at all we have to give we have to do ventricular peritoneal shunt and then give very important point we have to withhold anti parasitic drug when person has hydrocephalus yeah the three main forms of treatment for neurocystic sarcosis is, is anti parasitic treatment that is albendazole or praziquantel steroids and then anti epileptic drugs so now let's see one by one the anti parasitic drugs albendazole and praziquantel we give it when there are parenchymal lesions the albendazole dose is 15 mg per kg body weight per day we give for about 8 to 28 days generally we say 21 days but the range is 8 to 28 days praziquantel we give in a dose of 50 mg per kg in three divided doses again for a period of 15 to 30 days the combination both albendazole and praziquantel is preferred when there are more than two cells otherwise one drug preferably albendazole is sufficient the anti parasitic treatment that is albendazole and praziquantel have to be awarded in certain situations what are they one as i said earlier when there is hydrocephalus we need to avoid we do vp shunting the second is when there is raised ict intracranial tension third is when there is heavy cystic overload even then we do not give an uh, anti parasitic drug fourth is ocular when there is ocular neurocystic sarcosis we withhold giving anti parasitic drugs like albendazole because it can kill the it can kill the worm and can release inflammatory mediators and can affect the eye and therefore surgery is preferred in ocular neurocystic sarcosis likewise in the spinal cord surgery is preferred but sometimes the according to the latest studies we can even give medical treatment but for eye ocular we don't give anti parasitic drugs surgery is preferred steroids as i said steroids we have to give in collateral cystic stage because there is a lot of inflammatory reaction because of the dying cyst we have to give steroids the other conditions where we give steroids are when it is a subarachnoid cyst when there is a giant cyst and as i said it's a dying cyst like in a collateral cystic stage the anti epileptic drugs as i said earlier the vesicular stage and collateral stage they are like acute symptomatic epilepsy lesions and we give treatment for a limited period but calcified granuloma it causes gliosis we treat as epilepsy we give for a long period of time yeah these are the basic concepts now let's go to the imaging when is ct preferred and when is mri preferred ct is preferred to identify calcified lesions we all know that calcium is picked up by ct scan better than mri so to identify calcified lesions especially the calcified granuloma stage 4 CT scan is preferred. MRI is preferred when there is colex, when there is cystic lesion, and when there is enhancement. For identifying cystic lesions, scoliosis and enhancement. Suppose, suppose there is a single enhancing lesion which presents with seizures. Now the confusion occurs. very important practical point we need to know whether it is neurocystic sarcosis or tuberculoma a single cystic lesion presenting with seizures could be either neurocystic sarcosis or tuberculoma so how are we going to differentiate these two in neurocystic sarcosis there's going to be normal physical examination but whereas if it is tuberculoma there could be tuberculosis so there could be signs of pulmonary involvement there could be extra pulmonary signs also so first in neurocystic sarcosis normal physical examination second there is no evidence of systemic features like fever or adenopathy all these are seen in tuberculosis so if there is fever or adenopathy the evening rise of temperature all or weight loss all these are seen in tuberculoma so the systemic signs are not there in neurocystic sarcosis second point the third point is that when we look at the ct scan in neurocystic sarcosis the lesion appears rounded in neurocystic sarcosis the lesion appears rounded 
But whereas in tubercloma, the lesion appears irregular. The size of the lesion is usually less than 20. 20 millimeters in neurocystic sarcosis. But for tubercloma, it is usually more than 20 millimeters. And in neurocystic sarcosis, there is no midline shift. It is not going to really cause midline shift. But in tubercloma, there could be massive edema and there could be midline shift. And of course, the scolex is seen in a neurocystic sarcosis. And there is more of conglomeration, lesions joining together in tubercloma. These are the six clinical points. But when we are still not sure whether it is neurocystic sarcosis or tubercloma, we can go for MR spectroscopy. In the MR spectroscopy, if it is neurocystic sarcosis, the n acetyl aspartate and creatine gets increased. But if it is tubercloma, the choline and lipid levels increase. In fact, the ratio of choline by creatine ratio is more than 1 in tubercloma. So in tubercloma, the choline and lipid levels increase, whereas in neurocystic sarcosis, n acetyl aspartate and carnitine increases. In tubercloma, if we take the ratio, the choline by creatine ratio is more than 1, MR spectroscopy. So these are all the important differentiating points between neurocystic sarcosis and tubercloma. When a person presents with a single enhancing lesion with seizures. So this is an overview of the neurocystic sarcosis. We need to know the four stages. We need to know the three important forms of treatment that is antiparasitic drugs, albendazole or praziquantel, steroids and antiepileptic drugs. When to use it to understand that we need to know the stages and most important to differentiate neurocystic sarcosis from tubercloma based on the clinical features and MR spectroscopy. So these are all the core concepts of neurocystic sarcosis. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture. If you have any suggestions or comments kindly post on to my YouTube channel. But please like and subscribe my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.